Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host. I'm the creator of the forum, and I'm your chief cat herder for the next hour of conversation. Now, today's topic brings together two very, very different ideas and brings them together with elegance and fun. So one of the topics is emerging technologies for education and technology. And we've been exploring that as long as the future transform has been going. We've been looking at new developments of mobile, mobile devices, extended reality, virtual reality, AI, all kinds of stuff. And the other is games and play. And again, we've been exploring serious games, games for learning as long as we've been around. And what I love is that the project we're looking at today combines the two of these. We have Ryan Wetzel and Zach Lonsinger. Both are at Penn State University. One manages the creative learning initiatives and the other one's a learning experiences designer. Now, what they've invented is a new game called What the Deck. It's a card game. It exists in digital and print format, and it lets you play through conversations about emerging technologies. So just to get them on, let's bring them on stage so we can get a better sense of what this means and how it works. So let me just bring up uh, Zach Lonsinger right now. Hello, Zach. Hi, Brian. How are you? Very well. It's good to see you. And uh, it's also good to see you following the uh, forum guidelines that every everybody has to have a beard. Um, that's, that's right. <laughs> very, very important. Uh, Zach, when, when I introduce people, uh, or I get them to introduce themselves, the way we do it is to ask, what are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big ideas and topics that are looming largest for you? Right, yeah. So um, thanks for the introduction, Brian. Um, as Brian said, I am a learning experiences di designer at Penn State. Um, I work on the Creative Learning Initiatives team. Um, and for the rest of this year, our team... We're currently looking at how we come back and work in the new normal at Penn State University. So we've been remote for the better part of all of last year. Um, so right now we're coming into a space called the Dreamery, um, yeah. which is where what the deck sort of originated from. Um, the Dreamery is this open collaboration space where faculty, staff, and students can come in and sort of um, get to know what we do at teaching and learning with technology. And right now our group is um, in there a few days a week, just figuring out, um, trying to get rid of the old technology, trying to get a new technology, trying to figure out new initiatives um, and trying to figure out what the new normal is going to look like um, when Penn State is projected to bring mostly everybody back in the fall, um, almost at 100%. So yeah, it's gonna be, oh, wow. It's going to be fun, interesting, and a ride come August. Well, what a great position you've got, Zach, and I, I really envy that. And uh, also, I, I don't envy you getting rid of old technologies. That's <laughs> that's much harder than introducing new ones. It point. is a hard decision. We're trying to figure out um, what to keep, um, if it has any specific reason to keep, if we can like repurpose it or use it for different mm -hmm. um, other things like that. So, yeah, it's um, it's a good problem to have. It is. It is that. Well, let me bring your colleague up. Um, and uh, if he doesn't have a beard, at least he has 80% of the proper name. Hello, Ryan. <laughs> hey, Brian. Oh, God, the naked. No, no. Oh, sorry, you. sorry. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, you too. Thank you for having uh, having us here. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Oh, I'm very excited. Well, you heard the question that I put to your colleague. What, the, what are you going to be working on for the next year, right? Oh, sure. So, uh, you know, as we return to campus, uh, we're going to get just pick up right where we left off and actually in many ways uh, inspired by uh, kind of some of the, the, the complications and challenges of the last year to do even better, right, for our faculty and students. So something we're looking at is different ways of scaling virtual reality and immersive experiences for the general masses, whether that's through easy access to commercial apps, 360 degree videos or building high-end custom experiences for research, or even finding ways for non-technical faculty and students to curate virtual spaces, much like you would just move oh. furniture around a room. So uh -huh. this is a, a key area for us to continue to explore over the next year. Wow. What would, uh, what would an example of one of those virtual experiences be? Uh, so right now um, we're looking at designing something that we are loosely calling the infinite museum. And I think the idea would be 
to make it so that, and as I'm sure many of, as you know, and, and much of your audience knows, creating new virtual experiences is a complicated time consuming process. And so can we dial down how long it takes to have a meaningful experience in that space and also to create a space that's yours to be able to tell a story in that space without having to become uh, an expert in Unity or a, or a, uh, right. you know, a 3D modeler. So these are spaces that we're exploring currently. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I envy your colleagues and, uh, and the students that get to work with you as well as to learn from you all. Um, well, gentlemen, you prepared a, a set of images, a set of slides to explain uh, your project and how it came about. And I want to bring that up uh, just to uh, just to show people, give people a little visualization of uh, of, of where things are. And uh, and if you could just introduce what is what the deck. Sure. So I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll quickly turn it over to Zach, who this is really his brainchild. So I think to, to understand what we're trying to do with uh, what the deck, it helps to know kind of the, the problems that we're trying to solve at Penn State and where teaching and learning with technology lives. So this is actually a, a central IT organization. Uh, so we serve everybody across 24 campuses across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And so any of our technology solutions have to scale quickly to potentially oh. an audience of 100,000. So we keep that in mind anytime we're designing a new solution or considering our options uh, to, to help our students and faculty have meaningful experiences with technology. So uh -huh. to that end, within my group, we have things like the Media Commons that invented the one button studio about uh, not quite a decade ago to simplify the, the video creation process, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we run a 3D printing service that's university wide so that anybody for free can experience 3D printing in their own course content or for their own exploration. And yeah. we're designing labs for immersive experiences uh, and, and doing lots of research and development on new technologies. So this is the perspective we're coming from when we design a new solution for our students and faculty. And one thing that we really wanted to help with is to make that feel like a personal experience, right? An experience that has meaning for not only what they're studying or what they're researching, but their day-to-day -day lives and the people that they know in their lives. And here at the Dreamery, we invite hundreds of students every semester in to experience some of these new technologies. But how do you introduce those concepts? How do you make connections to real-world problems that this gadget that we're showing as the latest and greatest actually has meaning for something they might do in their career or their future research. Sure. And so what quick what started as just an icebreaker <laughs> and an idea of, hey, how do we get them talking about technology quickly, right? And maybe about themselves as well, became this experience uh, that we hope is fun, we hope is illuminating for our students, and we hope is even challenging for them to think about how the decisions that we make with technology in this world affects themselves and others. Well, this sounds great. Uh, so this brings us to what the deck. I guess since you're handing it off to Zach here. I can, I can yes. set that. Yeah, Zach, Zach can take it away. Yes. Yeah, so what the deck. Thanks, Brian. Um, and for everyone listening, like if you have any questions anytime, feel free to just raise your hand and ask them away. We are here for the conversation. We're here to share what we built. And we hope that you find it interesting, uh, maybe potentially even use it where you are teaching or working. Um, but a brief overview of what the deck. Um, if you see Brian link to what the deck in the bottom left hand corner, which um, if you went to the website, you've seen this definition. So I'm not going to read it to you. Um, essentially, we built a card game. Um, and the card game is an exploratory one based around conversation. Um, so we use the term game loosely because in this game, there really is no um, winning or losing in this game. Our goal is to encourage conversation based off of technology, based off of unique characters that we built. And we are building more characters um, as we're currently working through our first expansion pack, which we will talk more about here later on. Um, but a quick background of what the deck uh, we kind of ha have how it started in 2020. So we started thinking about this game in early 2020 before the world kind of sh shut down. And I'm thinking about this around March of 2020. Wow. Uh, Penn State was still in the office. Um, and we got this idea. We're like, how can we get students thinking about the technologies we have in the dreamery? 
Um, so before 2020, we used to do these things called technology tours or technology showcases. Classes would come in and we would introduce them to just a broad range of technology from VR headsets, 360 degree headsets, little bits, 3D printing, robotics, drones. Um, it was it was great and frustrating all at the same time because we had a lot of technology and only 50 minutes sometimes to, sh to show this. Um, so we were struggling with how do we do this intentionally or with meaningful conversation. Um, yeah, so the main goal with this was technology. It's how to introduce students to this technology. Um, so we wanted to create a physical card game. Um, and then we went um, all remote. The summer came and we turned this into a summer project for our team. Um, and then a year later, we've kind of expanded outside of the Dreamery technology. It's less about the technology now and more about empathy. So it's more about connecting with different characters' perspectives around the world. Because um, we'll show a few examples here soon. But you'll see that the characters we built are not... Um, we were very intentional about not creating characters students would encounter at Penn State University Park, which is central Pennsylvania. Uh, we wanted students to have think about these technologies that weren't familiar with their backgrounds. Um, and it's no longer a physical deck. In fact, we don't even have a physical deck. Um, it's all virtual. It's all based off of a website. We do plan on printing a physical deck maybe in the future, but right now we're focused on building a very good experience of online play. Um, and also how it's going, we've gotten enough feedback and good vibes from it from around the Penn State community that we're working on the first expansion pack with a Penn State faculty partner. Mm -hmm. uh, she is an entrepreneurship faculty member. So the uh, expansion pack is entrepreneurship themed. Um, and she's been really great. We're hoping to launch an expansion deck um, in August or September, so with uh, coincide with the start of the fall semester. Very cool. Very cool. That's a lot of work. Um, and this is uh, and this is how what the deck looks like. This is what a sample of play is, right? Yes. Let me, let me zoom in on this so everyone can see it, and uh, and you can explain what we're seeing. Okay, great. So what you're seeing here is we have three card categories in what the deck. Um, we have the blue cards, which are your character cards. We have the red cards, which are technology cards. And we have the green cards, which in the first deck, so the original game, we call them reflection questions. Um, in the expansion pack, we're growing that, and we're going to be calling the reflection question action cards um, because the new action cards are not questions, but they're more, they have different prompts that don't fit the mold of reflection questions. But essentially, what you do is we have a mechanic built into the online game where you hit shuffle and the deck draws three random cards, one from each category. Uh -huh. You can see that the green card has a prompt on it that you input the character, you input the technology, and it builds this scenario for whoever's playing. Um, and then around that question, around that story, the players will usually just talk about um, how this technology affects this character from wherever they live, whatever they do. Um, and as you see, this character is Jeffrey. He's 43 years old. He's a farmer in Huancayu, Peru. Um, and he's an expert loom weaver. So you see these character cards, we built them in a sense that the character has sort of this backstory, um, where they live, what they do. And there's this fun little fact about um, what they like to do on some of their characters' cards is about a family, a family dynamic, things like that. Um, as you see, we have 15 characters, 15 technologies, and 20 questions. Um, in the expansion pack, we're almost doubling everything we have here. Um, so I'm really excited about the expansion pack. Um, I know I've been talking a lot about it, but I think it's going to add a lot of different elements to the game. Um, and we're adding more yeah. criteria to the character cards as well. So we're adding a family dynamic criteria. Oh, um, nice. So yeah, we're really expanding the characters, um, have a lot of more technology cards coming too. I think it's going to grow the game. Um, well, this is this is great. Let me just pause you for one second. Sure. Uh, friends, this is the this is the time when if you have questions, if you have comments, this is your place. So you can click the Q&A box uh, to type in a question, or you can hit the raised hand button to join us on stage. So we have plenty of room. 
So if you're curious about uh, why they pick individual characters or how they sh how they pick out which technologies, your questions about the questions, this is completely your place. And we have a quick question right now um, from Stan Heller who asks, how does the character inform the conversation? So Zach, let me jump in real quick and, and then sure. I'll turn it back over to you. So part of uh, part of the, the role of the character is to create a space where, especially if your audience is students, uh, uh, particularly we see a lot of first years, second years coming in for this. Uh -huh. They It helps them feel comfortable to talk about things. So they don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about themselves. They, you may pose these questions and they may sit quietly and wait for somebody else to answer. But if we're talking about somebody else, even a, a fictional character on a card, oh. it opens them up in a way that they're more ready to share. And it's not too long until now they're talking about themselves, right? So it's it's really sort of a an invitation to let them uh, to to let them share their their actual thoughts they're having on this. Um, another thing is this is an invitation to research. So if you get a card that you don't know some of the details that's on the card. There's not necessarily a time limit on this. Spend the time to, to do a quick Google search and learn a little bit more about this place or the kind of roles that these characters could inhabit. Oh, great answer, Ryan. And uh, Stan, thank you for the question. Um, and uh, this is, uh, again, the forum here is, is, is for all of you, for your questions and thoughts. So you saw what Stan did. You can just follow suit. If you excuse the terrible pun, which I didn't mean, um, and uh, and you can ask more questions. Um, let's hear a little bit more uh, about this. Um, you know, the uh, I think you've explained the rules, uh, which um, is uh, all about the conversation, all about the interpretation, and that uh, if you're not familiar with any part of this, uh, where you can just dig in and research. Absolutely. Yep. And like Ryan said, I want to just reiterate that research. That's something we strongly encourage. Um, a little later in this, we have, we actually built a facilitator's guide too for people um, oh, that can use this at their campus or university or school. But in that facilitator's guide, we explicitly call out, um, encourage the players, the users, if they come across a character card of a location they're not familiar with or a technology they're not familiar with, that's an opportunity to um, pull out Google or ask a classmate or a peer um, just try and figure out like how does Juan Caillou Peru affect this technology or what is a CNC machine? Yes, we tell you um, what it is briefly, but uh, maybe you could search um, popular CNC machines, things like that, just to give you an opportunity to learn more about um, what's on the cards. Very nice. Very nice. And then... Um... And we want to proceed a little bit further. Uh, you had, I think, three stories or three examples of people using this to tell stories. Can you say a bit more about that? Absolutely. So we picked three unique um, What the Deck stories that we've had over the past year. And as you can see, they're in the chronological timeline. It worked out super nicely. Um, the first, this may have been the first time we've ever um, held a What the Deck session officially in the summer of 2020. This was very early on um, once we were still figuring out how What the Deck works. We held play sessions before this with Penn State faculty, Penn State staff, um, but the Engineering Summer Bridge Program was a unique invitation from um, the leader of the Engineering Summer Bridge Program. And what this is briefly, it's um, a summer program that incoming students um, in the en College of Engineering, they pay a small fee and it's like a six week program where they're introduced to Penn State, they're introduced to unique opportunities available to them in the College of Engineering and at Penn State, things like that. Um, and they reach out to ask us, asking us to provide them with an emerging technology sort of overview because our group specializes, not necessarily specializes, but we offer a lot of services across Penn State. Um, Ryan mentioned a few earlier, the Media Commons, the Maker Commons. So we did a small introduction into those services, and then we ended with a one and a half hour session that played through What the Deck, and then we ended with a spark storytelling activity. Hmm. Um, so that was unique. We were kind of tinkering around early on with what if we added sort of an artifact that after they played through this, they built something with it. Um, so these students weren't necessarily college students yet. They were 
Um, they were in that in between, between high school and college. Um, I'm still figuring out um, how college or university works. So it was fun working with them because that, that was our first sort of full on student experience. Um, and that turned out well. I mean, even with the Spark storytelling activity, we hosted one of our Spark workshops with um, Adobe Spark is sort of just an online platform that you can quickly create a web page. Um, so we had the students work in small groups and then they created a website of their character that they chose or one of their scenarios. And they sort of built out their scenario. They researched the location, added in pictures of the technology. So at the end, yeah. we had about five to seven minutes where they all presented their scenario, um, which added a unique element to what the deck. Um, so that was fun to see. And then in the fall, we hosted this with IST 110. Um, this faculty member, we um, we work with her a lot. She usually came to the Dreamery before um, the pandemic, and we would do that technology showcase with her. Um, so in place of that, we did the What the Deck, um, which was our main goal of, of creating this in the first place. Um, and she had a unique ask too, which um, we did one round of the full character technology and question cards, but then we have a mechanic on the game where we can lock certain cards. So we locked the character cards and we shuffled a random technology and a random question. And then the students themselves became the characters in the story. Hmm. So they had to introduce themselves. They had to say where they were from, either what their major was or their aspiring career. And then just tell like a fun fact about them. Um, and then we all had a conversation of how the technology and the question would affect them. Um, so that was unique, a unique way of how um, how you can play this game. Like you don't have to use the cards you have. You can put yourself into the story, which was really good. So you were, I mean, within, it sounds like within weeks of you launching it, this became a storytelling tool along with uh, role play. Yes, yes. Storytelling is a big aspect of our group. We, um, technology is important, but we like to use technology to tell stories or through storytelling. If technology works, we pull that in too. Um, but we felt, I mean, storytelling is as old as humans are, and that's just yeah. how yeah. we connect with things. Yeah. Uh, so we always feel that's a powerful tool to intertwine into almost everything we do, right? <laughs> well, do, I think this is very, very exciting. Um, how about, do you want to just, let's just walk through a, a hand of the game. Sure. And, um, what, I, what I'd like to do is, uh, in, in a second, I want to flash one, um, just, just quickly generate uh, three uh, random cards and put them up. But I would like to uh, get one person from uh, the participant swarm, one person from the audience to be a volunteer. Um, so if you'd like to join us, just click the raised hand button at the bottom of the screen. Who would like to be the first to come up? I promise we're all pretty nice. Uh, and and, the, and there, remember, there's no losing the game. It's entirely about conversation. Just click the raised hand button if you want to join us. Otherwise, you'll have the terrible spectacle of watching Ryan and Zach um, play completely. And you don't want the designers playing. They're just, they're not good. So who wants to join us up front? Who wants to come up in, uh, on stage? Oh, I see nobody's twitching. Everyone's nervous about this. We can't, oh, no. All right. I think we're going to have to try it out for them. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We did get one. We found, uh, Of course. Who else? But the awesome Roxanne Riskin from Connecticut. Let me bring our dear friend up on stage. Hello, Roxanne. Whoop! And we switched her off. Oh, first thing. No. no Sorry, I had to get my mic. Oh, my <laughs> good. Understood. Well, welcome. Glad you could join us. Um, so Thank let's, you. Let's, uh, oh, that's terrific. Well, let's let, let's take a, let's take a round of this. Uh, let me bring up one of these uh, one of these slides. Uh, this shows. So this is what the. Uh, here, let me make sure you can all see this just perfectly. Uh, this is what the you know the back of them look like. So these are the random cards. You can't tell what they are. And then on the website, you you press launch and you get three. So let's take a look at these. And uh, let me step back. Uh, Zach, Ryan, Roxanne, how do we proceed from here? Sure. So traditionally, when we do this, um, we always encourage this to be a facilitated conversation. So we have a facilitator in the room. Um, we've only ever done this virtually so far, so we haven't done this in person yet, but the facilitator will shuffle the cards. We, the facilitator, will read them out. Um, so the character is Tama. She's 51 years old. 
um, and is a shop owner in Christchurch, New Zealand, oh. and also an environmentalist or an activist for the Maori culture. Uh -huh. The technology we have is an electric scooter or car, um, which we have the definitions there, motorized transportation that uses electricity to power an engine, does require a place to charge internal battery for motor, and common examples are hoverboards, segways, wow. or Tesla vehicles. I'll take all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I would like a Tesla myself. <laughs> Yes. And how can Tama use electric scooter or a car to improve their occupation or their day-to-day -day life? And at this point, we would just encourage the conversation, open it up. Um, sometimes we would step back. Other times we participate if there's no one speaking. But um, um, I will kick this off to whoever wants to start. Just one quick detail note that you, in the reflection question, you put uh, kind of almost Mad Lib style. Uh, how can insert character name and insert technology? Very good, very good. Wow. Well, what do you what do you think, Roxanne? What how can what what's the connection between Tama and the electric scooter? I mean, do you think this is something that she'd be interested in because she's an environmentalist and wants to get to a post carbon, post greenhouse gas lifestyle? I do because she could use the scooter to um, uh, look at her carbon footprint and make comparisons to other people who aren't using electric powered um, vehicles for transportation. That's a definite improvement and an awareness raising that climate awareness perspective with um, her her um, customers, I guess she's a shop owner. So I would influence and maybe post that somewhere in my shop. I'll see if you use this vehicle, you will improve uh, not only your carbon footprint, but you can influence your customer's behavior in a good way. Maybe uh, without shaming, without climate shaming them. Right. About the, uh, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> well, maybe she could park it in front. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And it was with a big placard explaining. Yeah, maybe yeah, a like. Cool and maybe a map. You have me thinking here, Brett. Maybe a map of where she's gone to, and maybe post that on her social media and advertise that. Definitely, oh. definitely, yeah. definitely. Can use this in a marketing perspective. Sorry, is that me? Am I going? No, you're doing good. You're doing well. Yeah, I also look at the functional use too, like as a shop owner, she could use the electric scooter just to travel back and forth between work, um, which would also save her gas money or um, just quickly, I just Googled Christchurch to see that it's not a small town or small city. It's a relatively large population. So it could be just a way for transportation back and forth between different shops around town or um, things like that too. And as a shop owner, perhaps she's very entrepreneurial in spirit, right? And maybe uh, renting out a fleet of electric scooters in front of her shop encourages that kind of environmentalism wow. amongst wow. the city, right? And so then that gets me thinking about what does a business model for that look like? And how does how do uh, the, the scooters function around town? How do they get them back, right? What, what unique elements of Christchurch allows for that or would make that difficult? One of those uh, those app-based scooters, um, we had those in DC last year. I'm blanking the name of them, but I think they were two different brands. But uh, I yeah, think, they, yeah, San Francisco has them too, I think, or the electric bikes. The electric bikes, but also yeah, but also scooters. scooters. Uh, you, you could uh, you lock them or unlock them with your phone, yeah. uh, and uh, and people are driving around town with them. Um, now this is a this is a really good point. I, I like the way you're, you're running with this in terms of the business. I mean that Tama is a business owner, so this can be a way for her to illustrate this, uh, also to show her work. Um, if Craig Church is that uh, widespread a place, then she can uh, basically advertise herself by driving around to, depending on her business, to pick up supplies, to meet with clients, that kind of thing. Um, I, I, I did. Have, oh, go ahead, please, please. Oh. Um. Is this a real person? Uh, I have a question. Is this, is this, uh, it's a, of course, New Zealand, <clears throat> excuse me, is a real place, but is Christ Church, you said it's, it's um, a church. Are all of the cards, are they real? Are they real places? Are they real people? 
and how did you develop how how did you develop the characters to put in here and who who designed them are, are they sensitive to diverse character i mean i have a million questions about the technology yeah absolutely you sure you want to me brian <laughs> i picked the right person yeah those are all great questions um so the locations are all real locations around the world the characters are all fictional characters. Um, they are built and generated using, we have a graphic or a creative designer on our team, super talented. He uses an open source sort of character builder that generates these characters almost randomly. Huh. Um, and he's able to piece together certain um, the clothings and he can add on spatial elements to change the looks of them. But yeah, they're, all the characters are fake characters. Um, and the names and the their occupation, we also randomized those using sort of this character story builder tool that we discovered. Um, and actually early on, <laughs> we actually still have all of their, these descriptions built out and written. So we use this description story builder, which um, it uses this form of artificial intelligence where we input a few elements and then it builds the story. It's like um, a full paragraph worth of like who this person is, like their mm. thoughts, their family, things like that. And then we would go in and add to it. Um, and our original goal was to add this description onto these characters, but we quickly found out it's like, that just crowds the character card. Um, so like in our minds, we have a bigger picture of who these people are because they have full backstories, which we're gonna include. Um, but yeah, no, their um, characters aren't real, the locations are, and they're built, um, a creative designer designed them, but are, we have a team that sort of added to their story. So like there, you're saying there is de definitely diversity in the characters and their clothing and their ethnicity and their backgrounds. Yeah, the yeah. diversity and representation mm -hmm. is really important That's to us. That's important um, to me, yeah. see that as yeah, an absolutely vital. So, and what and, do you do after the reflection? I mean, how, how does this end? I mean, I we reflected together. How, what's the ending? And where's the feedback? Where's the feedback loop in the evaluation part? You know, educators are going to ask all these things, or we're thinking them. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> that goes back to the first session that we had, where we were tinkering around with that spark storytelling activity, <laughs> where after the small group sort of had that conversation around this scenario, then they would take this and then build that Spark page. Um, so that was one thing we sort of um, tinkered with and, and we're playing around with, but we're not sure we like that yet. I think we're still figuring out, figuring it out, like what does that end game look like? Is it just a discussion? Um, is it just an icebreaker that opens up a class or a dreamery experience? Um, I think you'll see in the expansion deck that we are looking at that more closely. Um, with the faculty partner, she's really um, asking those hard questions and pushing us to um, figure out what that is. And with, since we relabel them action cards, we're adding a different mechanic into the game that sort of doesn't give a win-loss scenario, but kind of does. Um, and I think that's all I'm going to say about that for now as we're still working. <laughs> well, I like the gamification aspect of it and to add that extra card, even if that's the expansion deck, because it will give... Uh, yeah. the teachers, the um, your curriculum designers may be in an opportunity to look at that as an outcome base th that not only they're exploring it, but it's facilitating engage. It's taking kind of the back door into engagement with technology, which faculty mm -hmm. may not want to come in and say, oh yeah, do you have a VR set? And I don't know, they're not going to identify a fear of not knowing how to use it or, or feel embarrassed that they haven't explored that area yet. So this really opens up a lot of potential and a lot of possibilities for those immersive uh, design learning experience. And you could tell them maybe I'm a learning experience designer too. And Brian and I've met in uh, VR quite a few times yeah. already. <laughs> That's right. Very cool. Uh, we've got uh, a, a question and I observation. Should... From, uh, or just, just thank just you quick. for having me come up. Oh, our pleasure. Always yeah. good to see you, Roxanne. We had um, we had a uh, a question and a comment from CL. Uh, CL had the comment of if the shop does delivery. So this is about the hand. Uh, provide the uh, electric sco scooters to employees to do deliveries. Very good. Take that further. Awesome. The CL also asks, can you share the character building tool you used? 
So if you've got a link to that or something, just put it in the chat. Oh. Yes, I will find that. It's in our notes, our brainstorming notes. I will go back and find that while we are talking. <laughs> <laughs> the, the multitasking brainstorming notes. Yes. So well, something um, that Zach alluded to uh, is that, you know, this is still relatively new. So every time we share it with a new audience or do a, a play session uh, with a new group, there's there's always lots of feedback, which is great for us so that we can incorporate it. So we can make sure that there is better diversity and better representation in the characters, that there are different scenarios that uh, sort of open up conversation uh, in areas uh, that regard the real world, right? Or different technologies that we hadn't considered that may be very important for another field of study uh, uh -huh. that should absolutely be uh, included. And my favorite are always ones that open up ethical questions and then uh -huh. have Students uh -huh. kind of taking sides of comparing how they think this character may react in that situation or how they themselves may react in those situations. Oh, very good. Very good. Uh, do you want to try another hand with a, another uh, another volunteer? Sure. Well, let's see. Um, we have another volunteer or someone who I think I have just volunteered, uh, which is uh, our, our dear friend Ryan Downey uh, from Georgetown University. So let me bring Ryan up on stage. And real quickly, I found the character generator and I placed that in chat if anybody is curious. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Brian and Ryan and Zach. It's always nice to have that synergy between those names going. I don't know what we're going to do with you, Zach, but you've got that magnificent beard. So. <laughs> now I feel left out. Now I feel like I need to change my name or something. <laughs> this is the first for having two Ryans. Um, but just to just to let you know, I have a secret agenda in bringing Ryan up, uh, and that he is a tabletop gaming expert and aficionado. Ooh. You can see behind him on his shelves, you can see some tabletop games. Mm. And he is also a passionate educator and a very skilled and thoughtful one. So, uh, let's see what he has to bring. And if we go to our next our next hand, which brings up, all right. Um, I can read this one. This is Joyce. She's 35, a single parent with three kids, oh my God, in Chicago, Illinois, who is changing careers. Um, the technology in question is AI, which includes the ability to program a machine to hypothetically think and learn. It can be used to answer questions, learn environments, and extend human-computer interaction. Common examples are Apple Siri, Microsoft Cortana, and Amazon Alexa. And the reflection question here is, what does AI allow Joyce to ignore? How could this be used to enhance Joyce's career, or in this case, to help with her career switch? Interesting question. <laughs> well, Ryan, what's, what do you think? Ryan, down on what you think, Ryan, sorry, I'm reading off the screen. Yeah, I, I think that th this gives a lot of potential here that when we start looking at what does AI do, especially in terms of being on the market, changing careers, going through those job searches, we, we have the ability to craft that individual profile uh, for who Joyce is and let the AI go out and look for those opportunities all on its own and come back to Joyce with, well, maybe you want to do X, maybe you want to do Y. Here's an opportunity from company Z over here. And that AI is going to do a lot of that legwork that right now we would have to do manually going through Indeed and Glassdoor and uh, mm -hmm. LinkedIn. So maybe the AI can take some of that changing careers aspect and automate that uh, search for Joyce and find uh, some better choices that she might miss because maybe the words aren't quite what she thinks she's looking for, but the AI knows a little bit more about Joyce than Joyce uh, is looking for. Oh. Oh, that's deep. I, I look where you're going at the end, that we can learn more. She can learn more about herself through reflection, through the AI, than she may have had uh, um, right away. Um, oh, I'm good. always afraid of how much Amazon and Google know about me, Brian. <laughs> oh, I, I'm, I'm very happy with what I know about you, thanks to Amazon and Google. Um, I, I, I think this also, um, uh, I mean, I'm thinking in part about her being a parent. And uh, I'm wondering to what extent that uh, AI in this sense can help her with parenting. Um, well, I don't know the age of her children, but I wonder if it will help her uh, with the logistics of either, say, getting children to and from school or from daycare. Um, and if she can ignore some of those because the software can handle it. 
Mm. Uh, obviously, there are risks and complexities and business models there to consider, but that was my my, my first thought there. Even having the AI prompt to remember when homework is due, right? Or reminders about yeah. when, what lunches need to be packed, right? Uh -huh. Or even if somehow they could entertain the kids so she could just ignore her kids for an hour to get a moment to herself. <laughs> there may be really nice on that one, but... <laughs> or Yeah, I... Go ahead. Yeah, I had the same thought because um, I'm also a parent. I'm not a single parent. And just with two kids, it's just chaos. So I can imagine being a single parent with three kids. I think artificial intelligence could greatly help. But also, I'm looking at Chicago. Um, I've been there once before. I know the city can be kind of crazy. Um, so maybe if she does get a, a job interview, that she doesn't have to worry about figuring out how to get there, that the artificial intelligence can sort of just map out the best routes, the best time to leave. Um, you can just follow that those instructions and don't have to worry about getting in traffic or being late. Um, so that could be another um, thing that she doesn't have to worry about. Uh, including mass transit. Um, there are several different systems um, in, in Chicago. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, that's interesting. What yeah, are combining a few ideas there, Brian. Sorry. No, go ahead. Ahead, uh, if combining a few ideas there, uh, that AI could then uh, look at what time is the interview, where is the babysitter, uh, schedule that babysitter to come in, uh, take care of the kids. Uh, do, do, do meal services need to be brought in? Grubhub shows up uh, and feeds the babysitter and the kids while she's off at the interview. Nice. Yeah, that that is... That is like the dream, isn't it? With artificial intelligence, like that is talking about true artificial intelligence. Because um, just a real quick divergence on this card is yes. we listed common examples of being Siri and Cortana and Alexa. Um, on expansion two, we went back and edited most all of the cards. Um, so now we don't provide common examples anymore since we want to future proof these cards. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If you really get into what is AI, um, technically, Siri and Cortana and Alexa aren't true AI. They're more digital assistants. Um, so I think that adds another element to the cards. Like we're really taking another pass at these cards and making them better um, and in turn making the conversation deeper as well because um, I feel like we've gone more into these definitions and yeah. carefully reviewed them better too. You, you just gave me a stray thought. Um, if you want to do some uh, interesting sociological work, come up with a pack of technologies that is old. Uh, say technologies from 2000, um, if you want to do a, a little, or 1950, uh, if you want to do a quick dive through uh, people's uh, sense of the technologies. Um, Becca Davidson uh, says AI could eliminate jobs that conflict with kids' schedules. Ooh, Straight up. That's very, good. very good. Thank you, Becca. Uh, I had a, a question about this, and this is a, this is kind of bonehead question from the outside. Um, how does this connect directly to education? That is, uh, are you thinking about these characters as students? Um, and if they're if they're physically removed, I mean, one's in Chicago, one's in New Zealand, uh, they're clearly distant learning student, or are they uh, staff, or are they uh, faculty? Uh, what, what's the what's the formal link to education here that I'm missing? So the characters are, are largely stand-ins, we feel, for the participants themselves. And so especially when you're assuming that the students are the participants, um, we believe that, that critical thinking about technology is vitally important regardless of the discipline that you're studying at Penn State. And being able to know when to use a technology and, and when not to use a technology or when to trust a technology or when to uh, think about how it might be incorporated into their work or research is is important across the board. And so giving them these tools and these experiences to do that is cross-disciplinary mm -hmm. and fits within uh, any yeah. of the, the many colleges and areas of study that we have here. That's very good. Yeah. Um, and one more thing to add there is we, we've actually had um, asks before from groups at Penn State asking, like, could you do a college-aged themed expansion? Um, or could you just give us cards for around college students age frames? Um, and we push back on that saying, um, what is the traditional student age anymore? Or would that not sort of put the college students in this frame of mind? It's like, oh, everyone's around my age, or they all look like me, or 
act like me. So I think this encourages them to think about um, everybody around the world um, and also introduce them to technologies too. So um, when they graduate, college is a short time in your life. So when you graduate, you could be these characters um, and how do these technologies mm -hmm. affect you in the future sort of thing. It'd be really interesting to do a round of this with uh, alumni or development offices mm -hmm. And say, okay, imagine these characters are all alumni, um, and yeah. then and then you can shape that. Like maybe they left without degree, maybe they have a graduate degree, you know. Um, and then of course flip this for admissions too. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could really task, you could really shape different games of this for different people. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Ryan Downey, thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you. Oh, absolutely! This is fantastic. I really love the depth of this and the way that this is so applicable to so many different situations brian you just gave some great examples of how to extend this so thanks so much high praise Ryan. high praise do we have time for one more round one sure. more hand yeah all yep. right let's let's advance this and who wants to join us or do i have to pick on somebody oh i would be so cruel i would be that cruel uh no volunteers yet no volunteers yet uh well i think it's gonna have to be uh I think uh, I'm going to bring up Douglas Maines. Douglas, are you ready for us? Sure. Excellent. <laughs> Hello. And I've got the beard. Well, that's the rule. That's the rule. And now I fit in. I like this. <laughs> Welcome. And where and where are you, Doug? You're at the uh, University of North Texas. Yes, uh, if the Health Science Center in Fort Worth. Oh, very nice. I bet it's a little warm there right now. It is. <laughs> oh gosh! Well, thank well, you for not being... a dry heat. <laughs> no, no. Well, welcome. Uh, and let's uh, let's um, put up the next card. And what do we have? We've got Jeffrey, who's a farmer at Juan Cayo, Peru. He's also an expert loom reaver. Uh, the technology is proximity tech. These are sensors that have the ability to detect nearby objects without touching them. And this can be used to trigger other outputs, signals, or notifications. Common use cases are automatic doors, backup cameras, and vehicles, and so on. The reflection question is, what are the ethical implications of Jeffrey adopting proximity tech? Mm. Mm, this is a deep one. What do you think? Douglas, do you want to be called Douglas or Doug? What do you prefer? Oh, Doug is fine. Well, what do you think, Doug? What do you think? I'm uh, struggling with the ethical part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why it would make, make a difference with respect to ethics. Um, I would think it might be helpful in uh, depending on if the looms are automated or not mm -hmm. in sort of giving him notice if things are going wrong or or the making sure that things are in accordance with what he wants, you know, how, how things should be going. Mm -hmm. uh, ethical implications, I don't know, maybe it would, uh, and given Peru that it uh, would eliminate jobs, uh -huh. uh, take, take, take the place of people that are working with them or for them. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a good point. Uh, or it could uh, also take away from the handmade craft part of it, maybe. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. If that's what he's doing, yeah. No, I, I went in a completely different direction. I, I like yours a lot better. My, my, I, I was thinking if he's uh, walking around engaging a proximity sensor, um, the proximity sensor's response might reveal something about Jeffrey that he doesn't want revealed. Um, so yeah. if he's going into town and he's trying to give up smoking and, you know, gets ads for buy this new tobacco, for example, based on his shopping, uh, just, you know, for example, um, or if he's gay and doesn't want to be out in public and gets ads for gay magazines, for example. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of that, uh, Tom Cruise, Steven Spielberg movie, Minority Report, where a character goes through a mall and gets flagged with ads to him, and which is called Our Lives now, uh, in many ways. Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a great idea, and that gave me another idea of um, proximity tech. So when we created this card, Apple's AirTags weren't a thing. Um, mm. Now that Apple's AirTags are out, there's all these questions about privacy, about... Mm -hmm. Because um, essentially, that's a proximity tech. That's a beacon. You could drop that in someone's purse, and you can track someone. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder, like, the privacy issue of if he uses these on his farm, or if he uses them in his neighborhood. Like, could he track people? Um, mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Like, how would 
other people look at him in his community if he starts using this technology. Um, oh, good point. Yeah. Good point. In, in the in the chat, Becca Davidson says, "Proximity tech could help to keep various limbs out of machinery, which mm. is a very good thing." Good point. Well, like he's already got one artificial one. <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah, I missed that. I missed that. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Oh, you guys are sneaky designers, and Doug, you have an eye. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so he might uh, have a personal story there. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about, about the professional development, too, um, how proximity tech could play a role. I mean, for example, if he's walking through a market uh, looking to get a sense of what people are interested in buying and selling, um, if either, uh, you know, he can run software that he himself can detect, uh, can look for keywords in the area uh, mm -hmm. or certain sounds or certain images, um, to get a sense of the market, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of clothing, uh, what kind of uh, fabric, what kind of size, uh, what colors are being sought after. Um, I mean, that might be one thing to do for himself or for his staff if he has uh, people working with him or colleagues. This is a tricky one. And I'm just blown away by the leg part. I totally missed that. And that's, that's just brilliant. Um, I think another important thing to look at is that second definition there is they can be used to trigger other outputs or signals or notifications. Uh -huh. uh, and that's the true power of proximity tech, right? It's like you use these to trigger something else to happen. So what is he having happen when he uses these beacons? Like it could, he could use it for good or he could use it for something bad. Uh -huh. um, depending uh -huh. on that bad thing is it could be very ethically no, or maybe it's good. It's, not, I think that could get gray then. To encourage people to put limbs in machinery, um, <laughs> on, on a on a more benign um, uh, task, uh, Vanessa Vale, our dear friend and longtime uh, forum participant, says, "My blind son could tell you more than I could about application for disability access." Mm. Um, oh. That would be really I, so. Um, there's a term for this: uh, w uh, the sound made by. Um, traffic signals for pedestrians. Uh, when you switch from walk to don't walk, uh, it's aimed at people with visual impairments. Uh, not Navicon, there's actually a term for this, but um, it's designed to uh, appeal to people who have visual impairments, but it's also good for everybody else. Um, we we are, um, the opposite of good is the fact that we are out of time. Uh, so first of all, Doug, thank you for coming up on stage and being a great sport. I really appreciate sure. it. Uh, I appreciate your keen eye, thank you. And uh, um, for everybody else, uh, let me just say, uh, Ryan and uh, and Zach, what a fantastic, what a fantastic project you've done. Uh, this is terrific. Um, thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, what? How can we keep up with uh, where this project is going, and how can we keep up with the two of you? So the the website that was linked here is a is a great way to keep up with what the okay. deck. Um, you're welcome to reach out to either one of us through LinkedIn or through Twitter. Uh, and we're happy to share where that's going. As Zach mentioned, there is the facilitator's guide that's now available on the website. So if you are interested in using this in your own context, with institution, with students, with other staff, colleagues, uh, we are happy to uh, make sure you have access to that and, and that the facilitator's guide is useful to you. And we also welcome feedback on any and all aspects of this to make sure that it is as inclusive and useful as possible to all of our populations. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Well, once again, uh, thank you both. Uh, this has been a real treat spending time with you all. This is an exciting project. I'm, I just can't wait to hear where this goes next. And uh, uh, in the meantime, take care of both of you. But uh, you, don't thank go away, my friends, though. I should tell you where we're headed for the next few weeks. Um, again, just to remind you that we've got a whole series of sessions coming up on education and equity for black students, mentoring professional development, trauma-informed teaching, the history of personalized learning, along with extended reality. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this, and some of you have been doing so on Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE and we can keep talking. And you can follow me at Brian Alexander or Shindig is Shindig Events. Uh, if you'd like to go look at our previous sessions, either on emerging technologies or on gaming or both, just go to tinyworld.com slash FDF archive. And we've got more than 250 sessions there for you to look at. 
remember to subscribe. In the meantime, thank you all for playing this game, for reflecting on it with us. Um, please take the spirit of, uh, of playfulness and fun forward through this summer. Above all, all of you take care and be safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.